the way that the Innocence Project really got started was uh, uh, this case of uh, Marion Coakley, who was a, uh, a man who was convicted of a rape based on the testimony of three eyewitnesses in the Bronx, that he broke into a motel and uh, raped a, a woman and her boyfriend at gunpoint and then put the woman in a car and drove to her home and got more money from her relatives and then abandoned the car and left. And uh, so there are these three eyewitnesses, the, 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 uh, the rape victim, her boyfriend, and the brother that gave money. And he had 17 alibi witnesses that he was at a prayer meeting in the other side of the Bronx. 17. Um, you know, the reverend, all members of the congregation, and anybody that knew Marion knew that he really, um, you know, couldn't drive and he was... Uh, probably incapable of making it from the prayer meeting to the motel and back, and there was really no way of explaining how he could have committed this crime. Part of the evidence against Marion is that it appeared as though um, when, when, before the era of DNA testing, uh, uh, forensic scientists would use what they called uh, conventional serological methods because people secrete blood group substances into their semen or into the vaginal discharge or saliva. And uh, so that would be analyzed to look for <clears throat> blood types and also uh, other what they call conventional uh, protein markers. And uh, in Marion Coakley's case, um, I believe, if I recall it correctly, uh, they were saying that the... Um, the only blood type that they got from the vaginal swab that was taken from the victim in this crime was blood type O, and Marion was blood type A. So in theory, uh, he could not have been a contributor, right, uh, because he was blood type A. So the prosecution uh, put on a serologist, a good guy named Dr. Robert Shaler, uh, from the New York City uh, Medical Examiner's Office, and said, well, is it possible that somebody could be a low-level secretor? So even though they secreted blood group substances into their semen, but there was not very much, so you could get a false negative for the A? And he said, well, yes, in theory, that's true. And that contributed to Marion Coakley's conviction. So we were given this case by our old public defender's office uh, uh, in the Bronx. And uh, Peter Neufeld and I, along with students, decided to work on it. So. We decided to take on the case, and uh, there was a company called Life Codes that had just begun DNA testing. It wasn't in the courtrooms, and it was uh, uh, one of the f two or three commercial companies that first tried to uh, transfer this technology from medical and uh, research purposes to the forensic arena. So Dr. Shaler had gone to work for Life Codes, so we said, you know, Bob, Let's get life codes to do DNA testing on this case uh, because, you know, you know, maybe this will prove that Coakley is innocent. And they tried it, uh, but they claimed that they didn't get enough high molecular weight DNA to get a result. And then we went out and uh, did a, quite a number of things to prove Marion innocent the old fashioned way. We found a palm print on the uh, rear view mirror of the car that the perpetrator had abandoned and they had taken and we showed that it wasn't Marion's and that analysis had never been done. We found uh, exculpatory evidence that hadn't been turned over and we literally had Marion Coakley ejaculate at different times in Attica prison, <laughs> which we found uh, very disturbing. It was hard for him to do, uh, to prove that he wasn't a low-level secretor. So we proved him innocent anyhow, but um, we saw immediately that this uh, DNA testing would be transformative for the criminal justice system. So we held a uh, forum at Cardozo Law School uh, with uh, a number of people that were at the very early stages of using forensic DNA testing. I think it was the first uh, such program that we'd had in a law school and became very interested in the topic. And uh, then uh, Governor Cuomo, Mario Cuomo, uh, appointed uh, Peter and I to a commission uh, to look at the transfer of uh, DNA technology to forensic purposes. And we became involved with some people uh, at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, this fellow Jan Witkowski, who then in turn introduced us 
to a number of uh, scientists at uh, Cold Spring Harmer seminars. Um, and that is really how we got our start uh, in dealing with uh, uh, DNA evidence in the criminal justice system. Right after the Marion Coakley case, um, there was another case involving a, an individual named Castro in the Bronx. And after we did this seminar at Cardozo Law School, one of the people from the public defender's office says, well, you guys are very interested in this. Um, could you do the admissibility hearing? The prosecution wants to prove that blood on uh, Mr. Castro's watch is not his blood, but is actually the blood from the murder victim. So we were initially very suspicious based on our early dealings with Life Goes because we could see that they hadn't published peer review articles and uh, they hadn't done some of the basic validation research that you would expect for this technology transfer. And so we got the evidence in this case and uh, uh, we never contested in the Castro case that the exclusion, that the blood on the watch wasn't from Castro because uh, the way these DNA tests work, you know, you would see these bands, they had what they called uh, RFLP testing at that time that had to do with bands going down in a gel and you would see it, the bands were clearly not aligned, then it was an exclusion and there was no dispute about the exclusion, so we didn't dispute that. But when they said, well, these bands that don't look the same are really the same and then we can make an inference about the statistical significance of that by looking at population genetic evidence, well, there were some very serious scientific problems with that. So we went to these Cold Spring Harbor seminars and we started showing what they call the auto rads and some of the data to the scientists there. And we ran into this uh, Dr. Eric Lander, who's quite an extraordinary figure, a very brilliant man. Um, and he was looking at it and he immediately realized, oh my God, here we are in the genetics community and we all believe that this technology transfer is going to work because it's such a robust technology and it's, you know, of course DNA testing is going to work. Um, but then when he saw how this was being misapplied and they were not, had not done the right validation studies to prove that the things matched and they hadn't done the population genetics work uh, adequately to give us a real statement about what the significance of it was within certain populations. And it was quite an extraordinary, it's a, sort of a landmark case because what happened, we did a six month evidentiary hearing. There were Nobel Prize winners on the prosecution side. We had all these great scientists. And by the end of the hearing, um, Eric wrote an article about it in Nature, but what happened is he got uh, the prosecution scientists to agree with our scientists and about the data, and they conceded. And they wrote a joint statement at the end of the hearing uh, that uh, uh, you couldn't match the fragments, you couldn't make an adequate statement about their significance, and called on the National Academy of Sciences to convene a panel immediately to help with the transfer of this technology from medical and research purposes to the forensic arena. And that was really a great and extraordinary development. Um, and that's really how we began. And so we knew immediately that uh, DNA would uh, uh, prove a lot of people innocent. And we knew, uh, frankly, from the beginning uh, that it would change people's view of eyewitness identification, confession evidence, all kinds of different forensic assays. So after the Castro case, even though, uh, so we knew there were problems with DNA, but we also, you know, and we wanted to see it work well and be admissible, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, we saw the problems in this technology transfer and were actively involved in that National Academy of Science report and a commission that was set up on the future of DNA testing by the Department of Justice that turned out to be very important. Uh, and so we started the Innocence Project in 1992. Uh, really, even earlier than that, we started working on these cases uh, to use DNA to exonerate people who didn't commit the crime. Uh, but what we're probably better known uh, for our involvement, uh, 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 we always knew the Innocence Project was going to be you know, extraordinarily important. Uh, uh, but it became inevitable uh, when O.J. Simpson was driving around the Bronco and I was literally in Madison Square Garden watching a playoff game and seeing the Bronco going around. I just knew, oh, we're going to get called. And, uh, and sure enough, we did because it had to do with uh, bloodstains 
you know, on a walkway, and we knew that the defense lawyers would eventually call us just for advice on how to handle the serology evidence, how the DNA should be tested, uh, you know, because this was an area of expertise that we had, and the, the legal community all knew this. Um, and so, you know, literally, while they're doing the hearings, we would, you know, send questions to Jerry Ullman and Bob Shapiro about, you know, how the evidence was processed, what they should ask, et cetera. And then... Uh, it's not something that, you know, we ever wanted, per se. Um, but people forget that the DNA testing was going on uh, before, uh, even after they picked the jury. They were still doing serological and DNA testing and other forensic testing in the Simpson case. Um, so in any event, we were called in to be part of that defense team. And uh, everybody thought that we were going to challenge the... Uh, the technology, per se. And uh, that's not something that, you know, we did because that wasn't really, uh, you know, the defense in the matter had to do with the way they mishandled its collection. And uh, there's not much good that can be said uh, came out of the, the O.J. Simpson case for the American criminal justice system. I think it exacerbated problems of race in this country uh, uh, enormously. Um, I think it destroyed... Um, the sensible coverage of uh, courts with cameras in the courtroom. It led to the Nancy Graceification of, uh, you know, coverage of uh, trials uh, and, you know, more media circus and less uh, an opportunity to learn. Because uh, I was very involved with my friend uh, from college, Steve Brill, who started Court TV. And I think he, uh, you know, started in a very, you know, serious and serious way to make it real journalism and, you know, really learn something from the coverage of uh, trial courts. And the Simpson case was such an insane circus, I think it really set us all back that way. But the one interesting thing that did come out of it is that the way that we uh, um, critique the DNA evidence in terms of how it was picked up, because our whole position was garbage in, garbage out, um, if you cross-contaminate the samples when you collect it, uh, you know, it, it, you, you can do all the DNA testing correctly, but that doesn't mean you're going to get results about who really is the source of the evidence. And, uh, you know, the idea that you would pick up DNA, um, you, you would pick up things without wearing gloves, and you did not change the gloves, and you would take blood stains and put them in plastic bags when they were wet so the bacteria would eat away the DNA, and then put them in a hot truck and then take them back to the lab, and then put everything out on a table and open a purple top tube that contained Mr. Simpson's DNA and have an aerosol, and then touch all the different samples. I mean, today, that's just insane and unthinkable. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is that the prosecutors uh, who were brought in to do the DNA for the, uh, uh, you know, Rock Harmon and the late Woody Clark, uh, Woody was really a great guy, we miss him terribly, um, you know, they, they understood that what we were saying about the way the evidence was handled was accurate. And then later, Woody and I were on this federal commission where we sent out uh, uh, things to police departments all over the United States. What everyone should know about DNA evidence, never put anything wet into a plastic bag, always change your gloves, all these, really the lessons of the Simpson case. So uh, the critique of how the crime scene was handled um, was very important, and I think the forensic community recognized this changes everything. You can't use you know, a 19th century method of collecting evidence for a 20th, 21st century technology. and. Uh, so that's about the only silver lining I can find in that case, if you must know the truth. So bizarre to be on the dream team. I mean, many of us on the dream team, you know, Jerry Ullman, Peter Neufeld, myself, uh, uh, you know, and, and, you know, Johnny Cochran. I mean, but, you know, we're all people that believed in uh, um, strong indigent defense. And I, I would say that in terms of criminal justice reform in my professional lifetime, uh, the area that we've lagged the most is adequate funding for the defense. And that, that is such a problem because when you're talking about issues of uh, uh, bad science, inadequate forensic science, you know, you can blame the forensic science community for not adequately validating many of these assays uh, or the judges for not understanding uh, issues when they were brought before the courts. 
uh, because unfortunately, you know, lawyers were kind of scientifically illiterate. Um, but the defense, you know, where was the defense? You know, we've uh, the, over the years, the Innocence Project, it's exposed crime labs where people weren't even doing the tests. They were calling it dry labbing um, uh, and all kinds of problems. You know, and we look back at these cases that we're now auditing many years later. So where were the defense lawyers? And uh, the problem was that they didn't have adequate resources. They weren't adequately trained. And uh, it's a serious problem. And you've got to reconceive public defense. Because if people begin to understand that a public defender is uh, uh, somebody that solves problems, if you want to keep families together, a public defender can assist in keeping families together. If you want to cure alcoholism or drug abuse, you know, the defender um, has a huge role to play, um, or even dealing with, you know, family violence. Uh, not to mention that if you have a strong defense in an adversary system, you expose police misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct, uh, and bad evidence. Um, and if the defense is not adequate, the whole system implodes. Uh, so that that uh, really has been a very important cause for me uh, in my entire professional career. The George Rodriguez case was uh, uh, one that arose in uh, Houston, Texas. And uh, again, that was a case where it turned out that the serologists at the Houston Police Department Crime Lab um, had literally testified uh, to serology results uh, that he had to know were false. Uh, but gave an interpretation that was consistent uh, to help convict poor George Rodriguez in this rape case, whereas on other occasions he literally testified to the opposite. Um, and the fellow that was doing the serology testing for the Houston Police Department Crime Lab, you know, was literally overwhelmed. Uh, they had taken too many cases, uh, they didn't have adequate resources, they didn't have adequately trained personnel, and what we discovered after we were able to exonerate George uh, with DNA testing, uh, that uh, along with the great Rodney Ellis, who is a state senator in uh, Houston, uh, but is much more than just a state senator, he's a, a, a force of nature, one of the great political geniuses in the country, you know, uh, we use George's case as a way to expose all these other deficiencies in the Houston Police Department Crime Lab. And uh, as a consequence, um, uh, the mayor, Bill White, and the uh, police chief um, agreed to appoint uh, Michael Bromwich, who was a uh, former inspector general in the Justice Department, to do the largest audit uh, to that date of any crime lab in the world. Uh, and he did it and found quite a number of other cases where uh, certainly the serology was not adequately uh, tested. And, and by the way, you've got to understand that when this happens, it's not just that innocent people are incarcerated, it's that the guilty uh, are not apprehended because they're not even identifying semen stains. And when the wrong person is in jail, the real person uh, is out on the street often committing more crimes. Serial rapes and serial murderers, you know, are... Uh, a real problem in the docket of the Innocence Project. So many of our clients were convicted of rapes and murders that they didn't do and while the real perpetrator was out there. So uh, uh, committing crimes again. Uh, in fact, out of the 314 post-conviction DNA exonerations that we have as you and I speak today, um, I think it's close to 47, 48% of them, the real perpetrator has been identified. Um, and often, uh, invariably, has committed other crimes subsequent to the one where the wrong uh, man or woman went to prison. One of the cases that near the, uh, in the first decade uh, of the Innocence Project involved uh, Kenneth Waters, who was convicted of a murder in Air, Massachusetts. And uh, when we got involved in the case, um, there was already uh, his sister, Betty Ann Waters, who's a real hero. Um, and Betty Ann had watched Kenny get convicted in this small town where they grew up, and they both were raised in total poverty, and she was um, a mother with two children, um, you know, a GED, and uh, her brother is saying, well, I want you to become a lawyer to get me out of jail. You're the only person I trust. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I'm going to commit suicide was essentially <laughs> the bargain he made with her. Um, and so sure enough, Betty Ann... Uh, eventually becoming a single mom with two kids, 
uh, went to college, and then went to law school, all for the purpose of getting her brother out of jail. And uh, near the end of it, uh, well, when she called the Innocence Project, um, and me in particular, uh, to assist her in the end in trying to get Kenny out of jail, and, and she did. And, you know, she's a wonderful, inspirational figure, and he was a great guy. He was funny and full of life and, you know, tragically died just a few months after we got him out. Uh, but uh, we recognized almost immediately that this was one of those uh, inspirational stories that uh, the media understood and, and, and really appreciated because of the love for the, you know, the sister for the brother and, and just all that she did uh, overcoming such great odds. And so everybody wanted to make a movie out of this. Uh, so, um, you know, we made a deal. I represented Betty Ann and uh, uh, with working title pictures and it was budgeted at $24 million initially and then the movie business changed and you know, you couldn't get the right stars and the script. But uh, uh, for 11 years, uh, my friend and next door neighbor, uh, Andy Karsh, worked with uh, Tony Goldwyn and the writer Pam Gray and uh, uh, made this movie finally, Conviction, uh, for a lot less money, uh, starring uh, Hilary Swank, who was a, really just a genius, uh, uh, who embodied, inhabited Betty Ann Waters as she does in so many of these parts. Um, Sam Rockwell, Melissa Leo, Minnie Driver playing Betty Ann's best friend. And I got control, so I had Peter Gallagher playing me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, we didn't change one name. Uh, and we're very proud of that movie. Um, uh, you know, it's a, if you want to see a movie that makes you feel good about being a lawyer uh, and just about being a human, take a look at Conviction. One of the things that uh, Peter Neufeld and I did um, after the Simpson case is that Johnny Cochran moved to New York. And Johnny was always well known for being, uh, uh, you know, he would do civil plaintiff's work. But uh, Johnny formed a small civil rights law firm with Peter and I, uh, and now we have a partner, Nick Bruston. And the purpose of this law firm was just to do civil rights cases. Um, and so we represented Abner Louima, who was the uh, Haitian man who was uh, abused in a police precinct in New York City uh, by um, uh, police detectives, uh, one in particular named Justin Volpe, uh, who shoved a nightstick uh, into his rectum, and it caused uh, a riot, uh, literally, in the city of New York. Uh, terrible, terrible racial tensions arose um, after this assault in the Louima case. And uh, uh, we were you know, involved in helping uh, gather witnesses together uh, and work with federal authorities. And it was tried uh, 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 by federal prosecutors. Um, Ken Thompson, who's now the district attorney in Kings County, was one of the prosecutors on the case. And uh, Zach Carter was a U.S. attorney. He's now the corporation counsel in the city of New York and is a great public servant. Um, and Alan Weingrad, who from whom I learned an enormous amount, prosecuted this case. And uh, what was great about it is that not only were uh, a number of police officers convicted who, uh, you know, were guilty and committed this crime, but most importantly, we filed this lawsuit not just against the city of New York, but we filed it against the Patrolman's Benevolent Association. We sued the union. And uh, Abner waited many, many years um, to settle it for then a record-setting monetary recovery, but it wasn't the money. Uh, we got non-economic uh, relief from the city. Uh, uh, there used to be a rule, they called it the 48-hour rule, where police officers at the scene of a shooting or an incident couldn't be questioned for 48 hours till they spoke to their union delegates. And then the city agreed not to renew that rule. Um, and then we got a, a relief where uh, a good police officer doesn't have to be bad, afraid of the bad police officer can actually uh, uh, get a separate lawyer uh, from the union because there can be conflicts of interest uh, because they all got together and made up a story in the Louima case. That was our theory in suing the union. Uh, so we were very proud of that work and we formed this civil rights law firm. Um, and soon after that, we worked on the Diallo case for a while. 
We represented these young men that were racially profiled in the New Jersey Turnpike and shot by police officers. We represented New Jersey state troopers. And we've done civil rights cases all across the country, including cases where people were wrongfully convicted. And then we sue, uh, not just trying to get them uh, you know, compensation, but in each of these cases, um, we try to get non-economic relief. So we sued the city of Detroit in a false confession case, and they agreed to videotape interrogations, something that, you know, the, even our local co-counsel, Saul Green, had been the U.S. attorney there, couldn't get when he was a U.S. attorney. So um, there, there's certain great uh, uh, benefits one can get from filing federal civil rights cases in these matters. The issue of compensating the wrongfully convicted has been a very difficult one. You know, we have statutes across the country uh, that uh, um, in some cases give monetary relief. A lot of them are woefully inadequate. Interestingly, and I think it's a good example for the country, Texas has a good one. In Texas, you can get $180,000, $160,000 a year for each year you were in. 80000 in cash and 80000 in an annuity. Now, why would Texas do this? Well, one reason is that we got a lot of people out of prison. <laughs> and so they knew they were going to be sued. Um, and they realized that rather than have these lawsuits, you know, where literally it would be millions of dollars, because if you're convicted and sent to a maximum security prison, the rule of thumb for juries, in my experience, is you give a person a million dollars a year, which is sensible and reasonable. Um, and that's what judges have given in cases where they were just judge trials on this. Uh, but, you know, if you put it at $160,000, it's probably the squeal point right now. It would get higher in other places. You know, somebody can get that money right away. And they don't have to go through the difficulties of a lawsuit. And they don't have to worry about all the problems in federal civil rights litigation and absolute immunity for prosecutors and qualified immunity and all these appeals and finding the lawyers that will put the money into it. And it's very difficult kind of litigation. Um, so that works. Um, and there should be more statutes like this. I'd love to be out of the business of suing for people on this basis if they had statutory compensation on a no-fault basis. Uh, so not enough states are doing that, and we uh, still need more. So it's one of the great difficulties. I mean, these poor people are convicted of crimes that they didn't commit, you know, taken away from their families. Life passes them by, and then they have to readjust. It's very, very hard. And, you know, they should be able to be compensated right away in an amount that is, uh, uh, befits what society should give somebody that suffered the ultimate injustice. The work of the Innocence Project, we used, have used DNA testing uh, to get people out of jail that didn't commit the crimes. And we've worked on non-DNA cases and we'll continue to do even more of those. And the network of projects that we have across the country does that. Um, but what we've found is that there's a whole group of causes of wrongful convictions that are well known and established, you know, and they would include eyewitness misidentification, which, uh, depending on how you look, is probably the single greatest cause of the conviction of the innocent, certainly in our DNA sample. And uh, there are wonderful, wonderful fixes that scientific research has given us that will minimize mistakes without really reducing correct identifications. Now, it's you know an inherent problem, eyewitness identification, but there are these fixes that come out of 30 years of terrific scientific research by psychologists, and now we are making enormous efforts to get the police to adopt these reforms. And we find a lot of police departments you know, have been doing this across the country. And we won a landmark case in the New Jersey Supreme Court that also would inform jurors about a lot of this research and its uh, uh, effects. Um, and uh, Oregon Supreme Court has followed that, and soon we expect a report from the National Academy of Sciences uh, that really gives you the factors uh, as a juror that you need to know uh, that can affect eyewitness identification and make it less reliable or more reliable under different circumstances. And it's really an effort to bring the, all the scientific research and have it adequately transferred into the courtroom. 
um, and to uh, adequately inform jurors and to change police practices. So we've had a lot of success, I think, uh, in the eyewitness area. Uh, we're also looking at false confessions, which is uh, an extraordinary uh, cause of wrongful convictions. The simple fix, of course, is to videotape them. Uh, and that uh, we're getting in state after state after state. And the FBI just this year has finally agreed the, to videotape interrogations, which is a big step forward. Um, and it's not just videotaping, although that's going to help enormously to have that record, uh, but also better training on how to conduct interrogations. Uh, because uh, there's a lot to learn in this area, again, from psychologists about the best way to do it. And we really have to get the courts now to look at reliability. Uh, because courts, unfortunately, have looked at confessions and saying, well, it's admissible if it's voluntary. Well, what the police and the professionals in the area of interrogation will tell you, the most important thing to look at is reliability. That is to say, if you certainly have a record of a videotape of interrogation, you can see if the suspect is giving information that only the police and the suspect would know, and whether that information independently leads to other incriminating information. That is what I think law enforcement uh, officials all across the world would agree are the measures of what is a reliable interrogation. And that has to be recognized more by the courts, and we have to train law enforcement on how to do that uh, better. We've now gotten post-conviction DNA statutes in all 50 states, but not all of them are as good as they should be. Um, and so that is moving. But we need better access, frankly, to the DNA databases. Uh, we're going to need access to fingerprint databases when they get better. Uh, but uh, uh, so we've made enormous strides because you've got to appreciate when we started the Innocence Project, there wasn't one place in the country that had a statute that allowed for post-conviction DNA testing. So we really had to start from scratch. I feel, and my colleague Peter Neufeld, and everybody that works on the Innocence Project in New York and in the other projects across the country, we feel we're involved in an international human rights movement. Um, because it has uh, been established now in uh, you know, the United Kingdom, Norway, Israel, uh, China, uh, you know, people are trying to start, well, Taiwan, uh, uh, trying to start Innocence Pride. They're very interested in uh, 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 mainland China as well um, in, in this whole issue, and they've had delegations over to look at it. But um, I think that it's, a, you know, a, it's an essential human right. Um, no matter what kind of a system you have, whether it's adversarial or inquisitional, there has to be a mechanism in place for people to be able to prove after an adjudication that they really didn't commit the crime. Um, and, you know, we've had problems in the American criminal justice system being able to get back into court to prove innocence, and we now have established that far more innocent people are convicted than anybody ever really thought. Um, it was really a, a necessary fiction to believe that we have an infallible system, but it certainly isn't, and there's no good reason to believe it is um, infallible. Uh, indeed, you know, I think the, you know, a law student should say, well, what's really great about the Innocence Project is not simply uh, that you're able to save a life or the lives of the family members of the wrongfully incarcerated and the wrongfully convicted. Um, but take a look at the work that's come out of the innocence movement um, in forensic science, uh, where we're able to now uh, stand up in the federal government, uh, a real effort to involve the mainstream scientific community in uh, actually validating uh, and making more reliable things like fingerprints or ballistics tool marks on bullets or maybe some assays will never be validated like bite mark evidence. And, you know, we're in a brave new world of digital evidence. It's extraordinary how quickly this technological change is coming. And the criminal justice system has to catch up. Um, and we can't afford anymore to have uh, uh, lawyers and judges that are scientifically illiterate. And I'm not saying you have to understand every aspect of the technology, but what you have to understand are things like how do you validate something? You're coming in with evidence in the court. What does it mean to validate it? You have to understand uh, sensitivity and specificity and probabilities and the kinds of things that are, you know, the staples of uh, 
scientific research in all kinds of disciplines. Uh, it's just unacceptable not to understand these things in some way anymore if you're a lawyer or a judge. I don't care whether you're doing criminal or civil work. And so I think the Innocence Project has had an enormous impact uh, on state and federal policy um, and uh, trying to bring the mainstream scientific community into the criminal justice arena. That's going to be one of our uh, significant contributions. Um, as well as, you know, and I'm including here when I say the scientific community, uh, psychologists and cognitive scientists. Uh, one of the areas that is of great concern to me um, has to do with forensic pathology. Because forensic pathology is something where we really need uh, centers for excellence and we really need to clean up uh, uh, you know, the problems we've had in this country arising from Karner systems, you know, where people who weren't doctors were making judgments about cause of death. Um, and we have to really get our uh, medical examiners for not, uh, not looking at just a, they shouldn't be opining on much more than just cause of death. We have uh, in the United States alone, a medical examiner can say, here's the cause of death. It's a bullet that went through an organ that stopped the heart or, you know, there was poisoning and we can look at the toxicology. That's all hard science. But when you talk about manner of death and you start speculating about, you know, the mechanisms and how it happened and, you know, start uh, interpreting what, you know, the confession was or this evidence was, that's where I think uh, sometimes... Uh, the expert witnesses get off base and they stop doing the science. And uh, uh, also, forensic pathology, unfortunately, has been a stepchild in medical schools for a long time. Um, and it's very important in terms of uh, public health uh, uh, to reinvigorate that whole discipline. So we'd like to see that happen. But one of the areas that really uh, brings it home is uh, a case I did uh, uh, in 1996 in Boston involving Louise Woodward, the so-called nanny that got a lot of international attention. And this was a case where uh, Louise was charged with murder for uh, the death of uh, young Matthew Epen, who was one of two children that she was watching. And when Matthew presented in the hospital, he had a skull fracture, a subdural hematoma, um, and he literally was, uh, you know, uh, uh, had the equivalent of what looks like a stroke. He had a, 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 a hypoxic ischemic incident. His, his brain was swelling um, and, uh, uh, when he was admitted to the hospital. And the doctors uh, reasoned from looking at these symptoms that what must have happened is that his head was smashed against a fixed heart surface at 26 miles an hour, otherwise you couldn't get a skull fracture. And because they saw uh, uh, subdural hematomas and retinal hemorrhages and shearing of the white matter of their brain, they said, aha, this must have meant that he was shaken as hard as uh, uh, an adult can shake with the head snapping back and forth for about a minute and a half. Uh, and it turned out, that when we finally did this trial and brought in the scientists that originally writ written all the articles about shaken baby syndrome, uh, they said, well, first of all, I can't believe that you're misinterpreting our article. You know, the, if you see a subdural hematoma and, uh, you know, shearing the white matter of the brain and a skull fracture, that can account for a lot of the things that we used to think was caused by shaking alone because they did a big study on this. And that doesn't mean that the baby's head was, you know, he was shaken for a minute and a half with his head snapping back and forth where you ordinarily would see injury to the back, uh, to, you know, the, the spinal cord, which you didn't see in this case. Um, and so, you know, th there was a lot of misinterpretation of some of the fundamental articles uh, that were the foundation for this. And uh, so we brought those scientists back in to testify in that case. Um, and now it turns out that the lead scientist for the prosecution, uh, somebody named Dr. Patrick Barnes, um, has recognized now, looking back on this, uh, that this was all wrong, that so many of the things that he had testified to in this case were not really evidence-based. 
I mean, you can have shortfalls that will cause skull fractures in children. In terms of the retinal hemorrhages, th those can be caused by the sudden increase and decrease in intracranial pressure, and we find a lot of it may be related to treatment. Um, uh, the, uh, we, we had overwhelming evidence that this was an old subdural that was about three weeks old that rebled. Uh, I can give you some technical reasons for it. Uh, but uh, now the doctors that were on the prosecution side have become the most prominent critics. And this is an area that is so complicated because sometimes the answers to these questions is undetermined, we don't know. But we have a whole group of people that are mandatory reporters in hospitals. You see what you think might be child abuse. And, uh, you know, a lot of these symptoms have been uh, uh, misinterpreted as being what they call patheno pathonomic or, you know, it automatically means it's uh, a shaken baby if you see a subdural hematoma, you know, retinal hemorrhages, um, uh, you know, and a skull fracture or something like that. And, and that may not be the mechanism of injury or certainly not the time of injury. And so, so much in this area has to be examined by the scientific communi community in a critical way, and it hasn't been yet. Uh, because it's so emotional. Um, I think personally that there might be some cognitive science fixes here that would be helpful because the main witness, one of the main witnesses that we had in our case was a doctor uh, named Elisa Jean from the University of San Francisco Hospital who was a great, great expert in traumatic head injury. She's doing wonderful things now for the veterans coming back from uh, uh, all these wars in the Middle East. Uh, she's uh, quite a brilliant uh, doctor, but what happened was is that we brought all the medical records in the Woodward case to a doctor in Pittsburgh and said, what do you think, a pediatric neurologist? And without telling us, he sent the data to Dr. Jean in San Francisco, not telling him, tell, telling her any of the other contexts and not telling her it was the biggest criminal case in the country. <clears throat> and so Dr. Jean looked at this and did a what we call a blind reading, right? She just looked at the imaging and the underlying uh, medical information, not knowing anything about, you know, accusations, the case, or anything like that. And she said, this is, you know, a rebleed of an old subdural. I can tell because of a whole bunch of factors. Um, and it was a blind reading. So one of the things that we're looking at doing in a lot of these forensic assays is have people interpret, the scientists interpret data without a lot of what we call domain or relevant information that can bias judgment, um, and also even sequentially uh, uh, unmasking, as one would say, other kinds of information. So you can read a CAT scan, you can read a functional MRI, you can read other data, you can read even DNA uh, spikes without knowing the identity of all the different people, and then you can get some of that information later. So you can blind certain readings and then sequentially unmask other data so they can make a diagnosis or make an interpretation. And that's very important uh, uh, kinds of breakthroughs that we're looking at. The problem of cognitive bias, not just in you know, law enforcement or the criminal justice system, but in all kinds of medical research and, uh, uh, and even you know, the assessment of intelligence is a problem people are working on now. And, uh, you know, I'm very glad that the National Institute of Standards and Technology in setting up this whole new system to try to put uh, a, a stronger scientific footing on a lot of these forensic assays has established what they call a Human Factors Committee, which deals with trying to inform the community of these cognitive bias problems. I take uh, uh, great pride in uh, the fact that we have a whole movement of people that are working on these cases, uh, obviously to get innocent people out of prison, uh, identify those who really committed the crime, but most importantly, it is a movement of criminal justice reform. And uh, that, uh, uh, we have made a, a big difference, I hope, in the system. We have prosecutors forming what we call conviction integrity units to try to you know, look at miscarriages of justice and work cooperatively, um, you know, with defense lawyers uh, to change the results. We're, we're really trying to uh, make some fundamental changes in the way the criminal justice system operates. Um, and a lot of it is involving, uh, uh, you know, greater scientific 
approach to these problems, but also a lot of it is, uh, um, you know, has to do with uh, bringing people back uh, to, you know, key and fundamental ideas of justice. Because I think that uh, properly understood, you know, that's what we're all about in the system. You know, the prosecutor is not just about winning cases, we hope, but about making sure that the results are right. And, you know, we have to figure out ways to uh, give them space to correct mistakes. And uh, whether it's the defense lawyer or the prosecutor or a judge in the system, you know, we have to do a lot better at policing ourselves. And when there's misconduct, we really have to hold people accountable. And we really haven't been doing that adequately in this system. I grew up as the first college graduate in my family, and my father was born on the Lower East Side of New York on Rivington Street, and he had uh, uh, seven brothers and one sister, and the, you know, probably apocryphal story is that the last one up didn't get clothes, but uh, they were quite poor, and my father learned how to tap dance uh, from a janitor in a bank, African American and uh, became a professional tap dancer, played the Apollo Theater, uh, got into uh, show business, had dancing and singing schools, was a producer of television for first the Dumont Network and all the major networks, and he had a show called Star Time, where the kids from the singing and dancing schools would go right on to television. It's sort of like Star Search, American Idol, you know, America's Got Talent today, but back then, <clears throat> and then he wound up managing uh, a lot of acts that came out of the schools, most prominently Connie Francis, Bobby Darren, and eventually he wound up marrying Mary Wells and uh, managing uh, Mary Wells Odetta. His favorite client was actually a woman named Hazel Scott, and there's a whole political story there, but because uh, uh, she was, uh, Hazel Scott was this brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, jazz pianist uh, who was Juilliard trained, African American. She was blacklisted. Um, you know, and had to move to France for many years. But originally, she was so beautiful and such a great and enormous talent uh, that when Adam Clayton Powell, the congressman, married Hazel Scott, he was known as Hazel Scott's husband in the 40s. So uh, Hazel was an incredible person, and she spent her last years on the St. Regis roof um, uh, singing, and Governor Hugh Carey used to come, uh, two or three nights a week, a great Irish tenor, and sing with Hazel and play. And uh, her funeral at the Abyssinian Baptist Church, you know, with Dizzy Gillespie and all these people was like really one of the extraordinary moments. <laughs> uh, so in any event, my father, that's my father's background. And uh, so it naturally followed that, uh, you know, we were intensely interested in the civil rights movement in our family. And, uh, you know, it was a classic kind of... Uh, you know, second generation immigrant household, um, you know, where we had the values of, uh, you know, your typical kind of left wing striving, you know, Jewish family that came from poverty. So that was it. My mom had a very similar background. You know, her parents uh, were in the dress business and she was from Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, it's a funny thing. It's, you know, real um, uh, emblematic uh, feminine mystique uh, syndrome because she was, you know, really quite brilliant, but, you know, never went to college except, you know, in her later years as, a, you know, adult education, um, you know, but worked for magazines and uh, uh, won punching bag championships and she won a speed skating uh, concert, the Silver Skates in Madison Square Garden, so... Any uh, person of my generation that grew up, uh, um, you know, passionate and interested in the civil rights movement saw that uh, lawyers in the civil rights movement uh, really were able to use law as an instrument for social change. So, you know, that was, you know, quite inspirational and just seemed like, well, isn't that what lawyers do? Um, you know, I liked Perry Mason, as any, uh, anyone you know, did in those days. But the show that I liked better was something called The Defenders. 
that, uh, you know, written by Reginald Rose. I think Patty Shayesky would write episodes. And it was uh, starring E.G. Marshall and Robert Reed. And uh, the defenders always, you know, they didn't always win the cases, but they always took on the great constitutional challenges and the really interesting cases. And they were always idealistic. And it was like, it was a great program. Uh, so, you know, I always uh, remember that. One book that had a lot of influence on me was uh, Man Child in the Promised Land uh, by uh, Claude Brandt and James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time, uh, his no novel Another Country. Um, you know, those books, uh, you know, had enormous impact. I remember Michael Harrington wrote that book, The Other America. I remember reading Silent Spring, Vance Packer's The Wastemakers, Eric Fromm, Escape from Freedom. Very strange. And Freud's Interpretation of Dreams. And I read that in seventh grade, and it had a big impact on me. All of a sudden, you read that, and uh, uh, you know, your everyday life looks different because you start thinking about the motivations of everybody's behavior. Uh, it was actually quite helpful. In the New York uh, public school system, they had these funds for kids that they thought were smart but, you know, couldn't behave in class. And, you know, these days they probably give us Ritalin, right? Uh, so it probably was attention deficit disorder or maybe I was just bored. I don't know. But I had, you know, I was a class clown and a cut-up and, you know, uh, so they sent me to the psychiatrist. I remember that. Um, so I was, uh, uh, you know, not a great student in elementary school, if that means anything. Um, and then there were, we had this personal tragedy in our family when I was in uh, fifth grade, our house burned down. I was 10, my sister died, she was seven. Uh, my parents, you know, suffered injuries during the fire, so uh, I was sort of dislocated. And, uh, uh, you know, that had an impact. I think I would have been in medicine or mathematics or something, but I... For some reason, whatever we were learning that year in math, in terms of fractions and decimals, I've always had a little problem in terms of computational speed. <laughs> it's very strange. Um, but, uh, you know, then, you know, I, I, they had the special progress, what they called special progress programs in New York, where you could, you know, you had the option of skipping a grade or going into what they called special progress classes. So. You know, my grades weren't good, but obviously my IQ tested, you know, pretty high. And uh, it wasn't until, <laughs> wasn't until my junior year in high school that I got really good grades, which was exactly the year that you needed them. Uh, so. <laughs> I came to terms with it um, in my 50s. Um, I actually went to this terrific psychotherapist for uh, about a year. Uh, I think he's really quite an extraordinary uh, man. His name is uh, Martin Bergman. He lived, he just died. He was 100. Um, and uh, uh, really brilliant. And uh, people probably know him because he played this uh, uh, doctor of love in Woody Allen's movie Crimes and Misdemeanors. And... Uh, I think I actually influenced uh, the way they wrote the obituary of him in the New York Times because they focused on that movie. But he played in that movie uh, uh, this character that was supposed to be based on Primo Levi, um, you know, the, the camp survivor that, uh, uh, you know, was a psychologist and committed suicide. But actually, the, the things that uh, uh, Dr. Bergman said in Crimes and Misdemeanors are quite extraordinary. I actually just used it in the foreword of a book written by one of our clients, Michael Morton, that's quite excellent, uh, that you ought to read called Getting Life. And I put it in the foreword because it's um, quite an extraordinary statement about people uh, dealing with suffering. It's a great existentialist statement uh, about uh, dealing with uh, problems in, in the world. But in any event, I, I, you know, I had compartmentalized this whole thing about the fire and the, uh, the death of my sister and how it affected uh, uh, you know, me and my parents. And I finally came to terms with it, where he pointed out to me you know, how it really had been uh, without my truly being aware of it. <clears throat> you 
you know, a, probably a pretty good motivating uh, influence. Uh, it's how you wind up wanting to defend people and protect the underdog, and uh, uh, it probably has something to do with what I wound up uh, <clears throat> doing professionally. Well, my father's position in show business was, because uh, <clears throat> I actually thought about, you know, writing, uh, uh, doing movies, television, things like that. Um, you know, but his position was, you can do whatever you want. First, you have to get a license. <laughs> you know, could have been a doctor, could have been a lawyer, but you get a license, you get a professional degree, then you can do whatever you want. I mean, it's not like he was dictatorial about it or anything. Um, but I guess, you know, uh, I, I never focused completely on the law. It was sort of one of these things that, uh, you know, maybe I would do it. You know, I've been thinking here at the Academy because I've been meeting economists, so I spent the evening with Joseph Stiglitz, and I started as an early concentration economic history uh, student at Yale University. And, uh, you know, I did well in that, and I was looking at, you know, the history of the railroads and technological change and, you know, was very involved in, you know, uh, macroeconomic theory and all the rest of it. And after all, it was 1967, and we were thinking about these things. And uh, uh, I was selected to be the research assistant for James Tobin, who was this great Nobel Prize and winning economist and a lovely, lovely man. And uh, so the fall semester came, and I was supposed to start working for him. And I realized, you know, I really didn't want to do that. You know, the politics of our time, I just, you know, uh, in, in 1968, you know, I'd worked for McCarthy, then I worked for John, for Robert Kennedy, then I went to the convention in Chicago, um, and uh, you know, I just couldn't do economics. <laughs> so that ended. Then I thought I was going to be a literary, uh, uh, you know, critic or writer. You know, I studied American studies. I studied the novel. Then I. Uh, the, near the end of college, I was making, cave, you know, uh, videotape movies, and I thought I was going to, I asked for a Danforth Fellowship to start uh, making things on cable access public television that was going to change consciousness, and we were going to do all these, you know, almost the equivalent of reality TV shows. Um, we didn't do that. <laughs> so it was almost, you know, by the end... Uh, uh, there was not a revolution, uh, by the way, by 1971, and, uh, you know, so I took the law boards and, you know, got into a bunch of law schools, and I just didn't think I wanted to do it, and then I decided, well, here, the University of California at Berkeley, it only costs $400 a semester, uh, and it's Berkeley, and I'd never been there, you know, and that was, uh, you know, a hotbed of... Uh, you know, political activity, so I figured, let's go move there. That's how I wound up at law school. <laughs> when, I was, uh, when I was at Yale, I was, they had just started city planning uh, programs, and I had an incredible, I got such a great education in, you know, a time of social ferment, you know, ferment. It was really extraordinary. Um, uh, there was a course that they had at Yale uh, on urban studies. It was taught by Jay Kriegel and Peter Goldmark. And uh, Jay Kriegel, I think in his late 20s, was deputy mayor to John Lindsay. And because John Lindsay had this connection to Yale and believed in, you know, the young, best, and the brightest, you know, we all took this course in the spring semester. And then in the summer, we went to work uh, at City Hall. Um, and then, you know, you continued in another semester. And Peter Goldmark was quite an extraordinary person in his own right. You know, he wound up running the Port Authority, the Ford Foundation. So here are these two totally brilliant guys, and we were looking at all these great issues. I mean, it's when I think back to that seminar, it's extraordinary. It was a self-conscious strategy to inform uh, poor people in the city of New York, particularly what they called welfare moms, that they were entitled uh, to public assistance because everybody believes that the federal government was going to pick up the welfare function because, after all, if they didn't, then New York City had to make all these huge payments. The city would go bankrupt. Well, it did, or <laughs> virtually did soon thereafter. 
And I mean, in this seminar, you know, uh, uh, they would talk about, they brought in this fellow, David Dirk, who was recruiting all of us to be police officers, and he was telling us about Serpico, and they had the police commissioner there saying, well, we can't do anything about corruption now because it's a long, hot summer and there'll be race riots. I mean, it was really something. So I thought that this was amazingly exciting, and so I started as a law city planning uh, person at the University of California at Berkeley, and I did take courses in city planning, and they had a very good school, but uh, for my purposes, uh, it was all about, you know, no growth in Petaluma and let's save Lake Tahoe and conservation. And I was into one-man patrol cars and sanitation and, you know, affordable housing um, and, you know, regulation of police. Uh, and that's not really quite what they were teaching. So um, I think they've given me a degree, <laughs> but I... I'm, I swear I didn't finish the course requirements, so I'm not altogether sure about that. But, uh, uh, you know, they, they give me things like I finished, but I don't think I did. But I did take a lot of courses and was very interested in urban studies. The law school at the University of California at Berkeley, when I went there, was a comparatively conservative law faculty. Or when I say conservative, I mean there were many brilliant and great teachers there. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the whole, the more uh, uh, progressive and socially active faculty was at Stanford. But the student body at Stanford was not like that then, and the student body at Berkeley was. I mean, we had a strike over third world admissions in our first year. I can't tell you how significant that is, because in law school, you know, uh, everybody wants to make sure that they get good grades, you know, in the first year, the idea that you would strike and you know, before exams was insane. Uh, but we actually did that. So I made many great friends there. But I did have some great professors. Uh, um, Paul Mishkin uh, was a uh, federal courts uh, constitutional law professor who sort of like adopted me because he wanted somebody who would give a, uh, a radical or left-wing point of view in discussing constitutional law. So before I took constitutional law, uh, he put me in his advanced constitutional law course when he, years later when I was applying for a, uh, to become a law professor, I asked him for a recommendation. He said, yes, I remember you sat to the left of Marsha Burzon, who was a very progressive judge on the Ninth Circuit. So, but he was, he was a great teacher and he really made you think. Um, and uh, uh, Jack Coons and Steve Sugarman did some really wonderful things that are still an issue in this country. Uh, uh, dealing with uh, pu financing public education. Uh, there was a case they brought called Serrano versus Priest that um, uh, stopped the state of California from using the property tax to finance public education under the state constitution because that would create inequities in terms of, you know, people with, you know, the rich property would have better schools and people that didn't... Uh, uh, where the property tax wouldn't yield much money, would have terrible schools. Um, and then they tried to bring that case uh, in the United States Supreme Court called Rodriguez and lost there. Uh, but there have been other efforts over the years to uh, the right to a, uh, a good and proper public education is in the state constitution in some states like New York and others, and this litigation is still going on in all kinds of places. So... Uh, 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 they, they, they did some wonderful work. So, I mean, I had, you know, some great teachers there, but it, it wasn't one of those things where, you know, there was one professor that, uh, you know, was really extraordinarily influential. But what's always important are your peers. Um, you know, it, when you have the opportunity to go to great schools, you learn as much or more from, uh, you know, your friends and the people that you're in school with over time as you do from many of your professors, and that's certainly been true for me. After I left Berkeley, I worked for a while for the, Uni the um, United Farm Workers Union, and I took the New York and California bar at the same time, which was a little hard then. And then eventually, um, after uh, uh, I went back and I worked as a public defender in the South Bronx for the Legal Aid Society for two and a half years before I sort of accidentally wound up as a law professor. Um, but, you know, and, and that was a great job. I mean, that really was uh, um, 
the right place to be for somebody like me. And it was a natural extension of what, during this period of time, there's a whole group of us uh, in this era that were, uh, you know, uh, motivated by the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, you know, and if you became a lawyer, what were you going to do? And, uh, you know, one logical place was defending poor people as a public defender. Uh, so, you know, that was a... and. Turned out that they sent uh, all the people that they thought had this kind of political motivation to the Bronx. So we were all there <laughs> when the Bronx was uh, really, you know, the Carter administration, you know, designated like the most uh, uh, bereft neighborhood, urban neighborhood in the United States. It was the time that they made that movie Fort Apache, and uh, unfortunately, many of the neighborhoods looked just like that. That is where I met Peter Neufeld. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, then I went off to teach, and we remained good friends, and he stayed there for a period of time. And uh, then I guess, um, let's see, in 1992, well, we really started doing these things in like uh, 1989. Um, so that was 10 years into my teaching career. Uh, Peter and I started doing these cases involving, you know, serology and then eventually DNA, and that led 1992 to the Innocence Project. One of the things that I should say is that, you know, I became a law professor by accident uh, because they started this new law school um, in New York City, the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law, and it was affiliated with Yeshiva University. And the idea, like a Miller analogy, what uh, Einstein Medical School is to medicine, they wanted Cardozo Law School to be to law. So it was a, a pretty interesting and bold experiment, and they started this law school. Um, on Fifth Avenue and 12th Street. And uh, a friend of mine had actually applied for a job there uh, to be the, quote, clinical professor. And uh, he decided, instead of doing it, to go to University of North Carolina Law School and move to Chapel Hill. And then he said, I have this friend, and he's never thought of it, but, you know, you really should hire him um, because he went to the right schools and he got good grades because he knew that that's what they wanted. So, indeed, I did go there. Um, and I really want to say something about clinical education, because even though I was always treated well and became a, quote, regular tenured law professor um, among my colleagues, clinical education was a pretty important development, and I got in at the very beginning um, in legal education. And, you know, I was able to start clinical programs, not just, you know, this criminal law clinic, but... Uh, and the Innocence Project, you know, was started as a clinical program, but, you know, lots of other clinical programs that in the law school. And the reason I say that is that uh, now there's a lot of talk about creating law schools only two years. And I think that's because uh, we need clinics, you know, for the second and third years to really enrich the experience. In the first year of law school, um, what we teach students is you know, quote, how to think like a lawyer, which really means we teach them analytical skills, how to read the cases, how to uh, reason about precedent. Um, and that's important to at least understand, uh, uh, you know, how the court system works in that way and the justice system works. But what clinical education always was support, supposed to do is that if you had people with analytical abilities, then you can take them to the next level and start dealing with in some instances, real cases, it could be small cases, it could be test case, reform litigation, but you would actually look at inst institutions in an interdisciplinary way to try to solve problems. And you would do fact investigation, which really, you know, is quite important to the development of law because, you know, you can have the, the analytical principles that decide cases, but, you know, who created the facts and how you gather the facts and how you marshal them and present them uh, you know, is enormous importance uh, for lawyers. And the clinical movement really changed legal education. Uh, then there was a focus on uh, uh, seeing the client as a person and uh, a greater understanding and uh, engagement in ethical issues. So I think that, uh, you know, and, and medicine has always worked like this, right? We have internships and residencies where you're mentored uh, in the context of really treating patients. And, uh, you know, so the clinical movement in American legal education, I think, has had an enormous impact. 
Um, and certainly I think that uh, all the work that I've done <clears throat> with my colleagues is uh, not just, uh, you know, let's say starting the Innocence Project and getting innocent people out of jail, you know, with DNA testing, which is this great scientific advance, but, you know, we've, uh, 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 it's an interdisciplinary approach. So we look at issues of psychology with eyewitness misidentification and false confessions. Um, and you have to learn something about, you know, molecular genetics and serology and, you know, uh, physics and pattern evidence and statistics and probabilities and, you know, all of the science, uh, cognitive science, which, you know, is changing the world. And it has to be integrated into the law. And I think that that's where we've really had our success. And I don't think that uh, uh, that would have happened if I hadn't been uh, involved in clinical education, because that's really what clinical education is supposed to be. The clinical education is uh, 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 in American legal education over the last you know 25 years, I'd say. Um, you know, programs have come up where you uh, uh, have professors that will mentor students in the actual practice. But it's, it's not just prac, you know, doing cases where you're representing people and you know, it started quite correctly and commendably in helping the poor get legal services, whether you were defending people charged with crimes or in civil legal services, uh, people that are getting evicted from their homes or can't get public benefits. Um, uh, but it's, you know, changed enormously. You have clinics that deal with health care issues, clinics that deal with intellectual property, clinics that deal even with taxes, clinics that deal with um, uh, public health issues. Um, and uh, you name it, uh, uh, there's some clinical component to it uh, um, in some good law school in America. And it's expensive, but if done right, uh, it's, uh, uh, I think, very important because it brings the academy together with real-world problems and you can try to solve them. I guess the first uh, uh, really big case um, that uh, arose, um, you know, so I was a clinical professor. I had students working on cases, but I would take, you know, major cases. And I guess the first one that... Uh, really caught public attention, um, involved uh, uh, battered women. I represented a number of women that had been battered, that raised battered women defenses. And as a consequence, uh, myself and some other lawyers that had done these kinds of cases were called in when there was this horrible incident uh, just a few blocks from our law school uh, where a lawyer, although he was, <laughs> turned out he really didn't have a license, named Joel Steinberg, um, had uh, uh, actually beaten uh, to death his uh, not legally adopted uh, uh, daughter, Lisa. Uh, he had another small child that he'd adopted, and his uh, live-in companion was a woman named Hedda Nussbaum, who had been a book editor at Random House um, and was drop-dead gorgeous. I mean, Hedda Nussbaum was a very, very beautiful woman. She used to write children's books. Um, and she became uh, involved in this relationship with Joel Steinberg, and he was a, a sort of a mesmerizing character, and uh, uh, you know kept on saying to her, "Go in, ask for a raise, ask for another raise, ask for another raise." Um, and eventually, um, uh, became batter of Hedda. And uh, by the time that Lisa Steinberg was found. Uh, was brought to the emergency room at St. Vincent's Hospital in Manhattan, and Hedda was seen. She had uh, she was unrecognizable. You know, she had a, a broken, uh, a, a ruptured spleen. You know, uh, bones in her face were broken. You know, uh, all over her body, and she looked, uh, uh, you know, twice her age. And when she was seen on television, you know, people were appalled. Uh, but this was a case that really did divide. Uh, the feminist movement, because on the one hand, uh, Joel was clearly a batterer. He'd battered Heather. He had killed Lisa. Um, there had been uh, heavy drug use in the house, and uh, uh, we all came to believe that uh, uh, they were literally, you know, sharing a delusional system. They would call it a folie a deux. Um, and uh, uh, 
but there were many that believed, well, you know, if you're a battered woman, that's one thing. We can understand, you know, either killing your batterer or, you know, we'll, 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 we understand that, we'll defend that. But if a child dies, even though both you and the child were being battered, well, that's where we draw the line and you won't get support from us. Um, and I am very, very uh, grateful to this day for Gloria Steinem, because Gloria Steinem was the person that really stood up and came to head his defense. And, uh, you know, that was not easy or simple. But it was quite an extraordinary case because it was uh, uh, televised every day in New York. This was a televised trial in New York City, the media capital of America uh, at that time, certainly the largest television audience. So all daytime programming was off. Every day uh, that trial was on television. And uh, it, was, it was quite an extraordinary thing because... The prosecutors involved in that case, uh, and myself and the students and the other lawyers that worked on it, when we really investigated the lives of you know Joel and Hedda and the children and some of the people that were around them, it was so upsetting and horrifying that we all reached the same conclusion. And uh, we managed to get Hedda into uh, Neuro 12 at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital and treated by psychiatrists, um, and then to this uh, other center called Four Winds. And uh, the prosecutors agreed to dismiss the case against her, uh, basically saying that, you know, uh, her mental condition rendered her incapable of stopping him and she had no complicity in the murder. And they did that without any assurance guarantee or quid pro quo that she could ever be a witness. Uh, and, you know, because we all really didn't think she could be a witness, but she did uh, make enough of a recovery where eventually she was able uh, to testify, and that was pretty riveting. Um, but that was like the first media circus that I'd ever been involved in. Um, and it was a very interesting case uh, and was uh, the first sign of uh, how cameras in the courtroom can affect uh, the proceedings. Very interesting. At the time that, uh, you know, there were the troubles in Northern Ireland and, uh, you know, Bernadette Devlin, Makaliski and others were, uh, 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 you know, involved in, uh, you know, uh, these protests in uh, Northern Ireland, the Catholics, you know, uh, who couldn't own property and couldn't vote. Um, and, you know, Bobby Sands was on hunger strike in Long Cash Prison. Uh, there was a group in uh, New York called Northern Irish Aid, and uh, they were uh, supposed to be raising money, and they did some of it, I'm sure, uh, for the widows and orphans, you know, in the, the struggle in Northern Ireland. And, uh, uh, but then they were arrested for running guns. <laughs> and uh, uh, so Paul O'Dwyer, uh, who was a, a real great man in New York, and uh, interestingly, had helped uh, uh, Louis Untermeyer, the poet, run guns to the state of Israel when it was being founded. He, he got this whole group of lawyers together to represent the people from Northern Irish Aid who were charged with the gun running. And so uh, uh, a group of us did this case, um, essentially pro bono, uh, um, where our clients in Northern Irish Aid were charged. And what we discovered during the course of the representation is that the person who was selling the guns to NORAID uh, was actually somebody who was a contract agent for the Central Intelligence Agency who had run guns to anti-Castro Cubans and to the Dominican Republic. And as the case unfolded, um, all this was discovered and uh, it became part of our defense that the government knew about this. Um, and they would have preferred this gun runner, uh, uh, this contract agent to give them the guns because you know they could control the flow of it and they didn't always have the ammunition they wanted and the, the spare parts. And it was quite a wild trial and uh, uh, they were all acquitted. <laughs> and our client, uh, uh, the lead client became Grand Marshal of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I actually did quite a number of cases after that. Uh, uh, and I had two clients that actually were tortured in Long Cash Prison and won judgments in the Court of International Human Rights um, who were involved in that effort. And so 
um, you know, I'm, I'm quite amazed and actually quite optimistic because having done all those cases at that time and seeing all the troubles in Northern Ireland, I never thought that would be solved in my lifetime. Uh, and, uh, you know, the progress that's been made, uh, you know, over the last 20 years is just uh, uh, almost heartening. You know, it almost makes you think, you know, well, could this really mean that we could solve the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian crisis or so many other, you know, trouble spots in the world? But that one uh, uh, made quite an impression on me, and I developed a lot of great friends in Ireland and uh, spent a lot of time there anytime I can, anytime I can go. What's great about uh, the American criminal justice system uh, and the adversary system, uh, you know, look, there's so many things wrong with it. We all know that. You know, the, the effects of race and class, uh, you know, and money. I mean, you know, look, you want to get justice, you know, have a lot of money. You know, we, we all know that our system is affected by that. But there is a certain genius to this, uh, to the adversary system. There is some fundamental... Uh, 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 genius to the way we approach this in a constitutional democracy. You know, and we find that across the world, you know, there are things that are useful and helpful in the inquisitional systems that we can bring to bear uh, uh, that are helpful here. We don't like to talk about it that way, but it's true. And then, you know, you find in inquisitional systems, they take a lot from the adversary system. I think that what's great about the adversary system, in a way, it's a, it's, it's a, a good way for trying to approximate truth and avoid biases. Um, and uh, I mean, there's something incredible about uh, you know this democracy, uh, where we bring in you know strangers to sit in a jury uh, and find the facts, uh, uh, no matter who you are, you know, rich or powerful or you know, poor, and um, you know, if we could, if if we could actually fund it, staff it, run it the way that, in theory, it's designed, um, you know, it truly would be the you know the greatest system in the world. Um, may well be right now, anyhow, but uh, you know, there's much to improve. But I, I mean, you just see it. I mean, we we, you know, this society. Um, is so inspiring uh, when you come to a place like the academy uh, and you see all these young people uh, that are, you know, so smart and, and so gifted and uh, uh, so idealistic, no less idealistic, frankly, than my generation, which thought we, you know, had the purchase on being idealists. <laughs> uh, you know, they're no different than we were. Uh, uh, and maybe just, you know, a little bit more technologically savvy and uh, probably better educated. Uh, so I have, I have enormous hope. Uh, I'm really, you know, a very idealistic and optimistic person. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and it's easy to be if you do the work I do. I mean, I've just, um, I'm really in a great place. I get innocent people out of jail. I try to reform the system. And then I sue the people that... Uh, you know, created the injustice. What a, what a great social space to be in in American law. And uh, only in America could you, you know, um, f find that way of making a living. Frankly, you just have to believe in what you're doing and understand that you're, uh, uh, you're playing by the rules and you're doing the job that the system uh, uh, requires you to do. And, you know, I never had any uh, qualms about that. I mean, we were brought in to do what we had to do in the, in the Simpson case. And frankly, in the issues that we were litigating, even our adversaries recognized in the end that we were right about them. Uh, but, you know, look, if you, if you don't, you know, I teach this all the time to law students. I mean, if you want to have a criminal justice system where people's rights are defended, um, it is just a fact of life that the state has to be held to its proof. Um, and it's part of our system that, you know, we want to protect the innocent from being wrongfully convicted. And there will be some people that are guilty that uh, uh, escape because the state doesn't have the proof to demonstrate that they're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The state screws up the evidence all the time, but <laughs> the defense does too. I mean, the, but the real, which, you know, is a, another, 
you know, great tragedy that, you know, inadequate defense lawyers cause uh, uh, miscarriages of justice as well. But the, 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 the bottom line, it's, you know, in terms of personal morality, right, it's role defined. Um, and uh, it's pretty, I've never had a problem being a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, you know, I, I think it's uh, uh, liberty's last champion. If you care about liberty and you care about a democracy and you care about it functioning properly, uh, uh, particularly for those who are the most despised, you want uh, uh, a good defense lawyer uh, because it's the good defense lawyer that keeps the system on it and keeps it running properly and prevents miscarriages of justice. Uh, and, uh, and you have to have the guts to do it. So I think it's a, you know, a noble calling. Um, it's a hard job, uh, but it's, uh, they, we really are liberty's last champions. I have no doubt about it. But you know, the funny thing is, um, a lot of my colleagues, they said, well, you ceased being a defense lawyer a long time ago. <laughs> You're just getting innocent people out of jail and then suing on their behalf, you know, uh, uh, that's easy to do. I mean, not easy, but it's, uh, uh, you know, I don't sit around saying, oh, gee, am I doing the wrong thing at night? You know, uh, um, uh, you know, I feel pretty good about what we do. It's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, yes, um, uh, you know, people know who you are, and, uh, you know, and what they really knew is that you know, we did a good job in the courtroom, so they knew we were very good lawyers. You know, you, a lot of people have reputations and you've never seen them try anything, so you have no idea whether they're any good at it. So if we knocked on the door, we knew that uh, people would pay attention because they knew that reporters would pay attention, we knew the public would pay attention, and they knew that we would do a very good job for the client. So, you know, that was helpful. Um, and then again, you know, it was a very controversial verdict. Uh, people felt very strongly about the trial, and there were some people that, you know, uh, uh, didn't like it and then didn't like us personally because we were involved in it. So, you know, it was sort of a mixed result that way, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I think overall it was fine.